founder and the host of the Poetry Den. I'm so glad for all of you that um, are able to join us tonight. We have a few people in house uh, and we have a spectacular featured artist with us uh, tonight as well. Uh, Andre Anderson, uh, who is, his stage name is Dre the Poet. So I'm super excited about that. Um, glad that you can, uh, can all be with us. Uh, what happens uh, during a, a normal poetry night is uh, we do an open mic and then uh, we have our featured artists join us. So if there's any of you out there that are interested in uh, presenting tonight, um, just let us know. And my friend George here, um, who is helping me out here at the Civil Rights Heritage Center, uh, he will definitely uh, let me know who's, who's wanting to perform and we'll make sure that you are able to uh, share your pieces tonight. Um, what else do I need to say? Um, I hope that, um, you know, this is the last one before the end of the year. Um, it seems uh, like we've had like a challenging year, right? Um, most would say all bad, but I'm sure that there's some good out there in the world that has happened as well. Um, so I think a lot of us are hoping for a better year. But I'm excited to be here. I'm excited that um, the Civil Rights Heritage Center has allowed us to continue to um, share poetry, to let words speak, to be inspired. Um, so yeah, so glad that you are with us um, here at the Poetry Den. And I'm gonna ask George, um, which I always like to do because I'm, um, we're definitely honored uh, to be in this space, but I always like to um, tell people um, what happens in this space and just explain the love and, co and the connection that we have with one another. So I'm gonna ask George if he'll join us. Pam, thank you so much for that, I appreciate it. Um, so for those that are here in person and for those that are online, welcome to everyone. It's an absolute joy, even as difficult as it is uh, during these times, it's still a joy to be able to welcome everybody and it's still a joy to be able to share poetry, um, and to, share, to share art out of this space, it's deeply important. And we have at least one person here who had never been here before, and if anybody's watching this, um, I do think it's important to just ground us in the space that we're in. Um, we do everything that we do here out of the former Angman Public Natatorium. It was the city of South Bend's first municipal indoor swimming pool. And it had that name public carved into the concrete. And I think a lot about that word. <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about it lately. You know, what does that mean? What is our responsibility to each other? What is our responsibility to human beings? And how, how do we take the messages that we're absorbing uh, being in this space, being in this uh, nation, being in this society? Um, and how do we relate that to each other? Because in this space, space that had called itself public, in spite of the fact that African-American people had been always and had been continuing to grow as a significant portion of that public, the people who ran the space, the people who look like me, specifically and deliberately denied entry to African American people. That happened for 14 years until it started segregating by day for another 14. So how then for 30 years did that word public stay out front? And what did it mean that that one portion specifically and deliberately denied the meaning of that word to include all people. It was an act of violence and it impacted, I can't estimate how many tens of thousands of people for that time. So what we do out of this space now, retransformed, is to radically and emphatically and deliberately make sure that we're being with everyone as best as we can, as often as we can, um, as frequently as we can. Um, this space has been transformed now as the IU South Bend Civil Rights Heritage Center, a space that uses the story of what had happened in the past, talks about the echoes that continue through to the present, and talks about the new echoes that are being, uh, that are happening every single day and affecting people every single day. And it's all from a radical 
belief that that word public must be applied evenly to all people. And so one way we do that is through education, through sharing the story, through teaching, through having the hard, difficult conversations. And one way we do that is just by celebrating the lives that we all live. And what better way to celebrate that than by sharing words and by sharing beauty and sharing poetry. So for those here in person today to do that in whatever form that takes, I am deeply grateful to all of you. And to all of you out there who are watching uh, who will share or who are just listening and enjoying, I'm deeply grateful to all of you. And most importantly, deeply grateful to Pam for the time that you spend, for the inspiration that you leave, for the organizing, for everything that you do to make this possible. I get the privilege of just showing up and opening the door and pointing a camera, <laughs> but you do the work of making this possible. And so thank you everyone for that. And I deeply appreciate it. All right, so thank you, George. I appreciate that. Um, because uh, the Poetry Den has always been a, uh, a place that has been welcoming to, um, to everyone, we felt that our connection to the Civil Rights Heritage Center was definitely um, a good marriage. And so thank you for sharing that. And I hope that you all will um, like their Facebook page or get signed up to their newsletter and find out what's also happening in the space. Um, again, we're still, as, as everyone else, we're still trying to fill this out and, and, and make this, uh, this thing still happen. We know that, um, in this time when we have to be separated, uh, we can still come together. We're pretty smart people. We figured out how to come together uh, and still do some stuff. So I'm hoping that poetry is allowing people to have that space to, to, to share, to talk, to talk things through. I know that poetry has done a lot, an extreme lot for me, especially in times of um, uh, turmoil and change. Um, I've been able to write and get through some stuff. And so I'm always honored to be able to be in the space to um, be allowed to, by George and uh, the IUSB Civil Rights Heritage Center to allow us to be here and do this. So what happens usually is uh, we do an open mic. Again, if there's anybody that's listening out there and would like to share with us, uh, ben, I see you out there, so I got you down. Um, George is going to help, you know, let me know who's out there that uh, additionally would want, want to perform. And then again, we have an awesome feature tonight uh, that's going to share with us. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open up <clears throat> with the poem, as I usually do. Um, my all-time ultimate desire is also, always to have my guests and have people um, that have signed up to read more than I read. But um, as we go through this, I'm willing to fill in some gaps. So I'll start us off with uh, a favorite of mine that's called The Mirror. Um, a lot of you may have heard this before, um, but it bears repeating. Uh, this piece was actually written to myself. Sensuous in your behavior, yet you waver to love because of fear. Fear that the past is too close to the present. And even though that shit is irrelevant, you can't see the future because you refuse to look in the mirror. A mirror you no longer smile in, but all you see is old wine skin because you've been drinking all the wrong words. Drunk on words that have destroyed your self-confidence. The evidence is you have not yet claimed your inheritance. There is beauty in your eyes, and the beasts are the lies that try and fertilize seeds of unforgiveness lying on the inside. You see, in order to love another, one must discover your own sleeping beauty. May you become the author of the book, I Am Pretty. And I like myself. I like myself because of the image of who I was made, a creator who promised never to leave me, but as long as I want it will stay. And I'll bathe myself in his blood that cleanses me from the stench of the day. A day that I will one day understand that church, family, and school weren't the only plan, but having dominion over my life, hopes, thoughts, actions, and dreams might help my fellow man. So when I look in the mirror, whom shall I fear? If 
false accusations, manipulation, devastation, or do I start a revolution beginning with internal evolution when I look in the mirror? And that's that peace. We encourage you at home, you know, snap your fingers, clap. Not that we can hear you, but it's always good to feel you out there. Uh, I'll read one more piece and then I'm going to invite uh, someone to read. Um, I'll do a short one here. I think, yeah. This one's called uh, No Hidden Agenda. I have no agenda other than surrender the hurt that was once in exchange for who I need to become. Sometimes including you means including a once me, a vulnerable me, a self-inflicting prison with one warden me. My memories of you lying beneath skies promising blue are bleeding from green razor blades of grass. I am reminded how I relapsed. I ran marathons with anger until the bottoms of my shoes fell like paper. I've longed for finish lines of forgiveness that only felt like traitors. Funny how the hourglass is now much louder than the minutes on the clock that pass. And imagine time wasted looking at your life through dirty plexiglass. I dip my paintbrush into tear-stained cups. Each new day, a new blank canvas with color I hope can erupt. The control to change my world are like emeralds and pearls, waiting to be reassembled with eyes released from tightened blindfolds. I breathe, I write poetry. I breathe, I write poetry. I breathe, I write poetry. That's that piece. Day. Do you would you love to join me so soon? <laughs> if not, I can rearrange things. You ready? Oh, rearranging is good. All right. Ash, do you want to come up and uh, join us? That'd be awesome. Uh, my next poet, her name is Ash. She's new to the Poetry Den. Um, she's out here from California. So please snap your fingers at home. Show some love for Ash. If you want to move that, Ash, you be welcome to. You just have to. It's not funny to her, though. Hello, hello. My name is Ash. I'm a slam poet from Cali. I was born out there. I lived my whole life in the West. And this summer, I got tired of living someplace that burst into flames all the time. Some place where you have to have more money than the devil just to afford rent on a studio in the bad part of town. So here I am. Um, the poem I'm going to share with you is, in my opinion, my best poem. It's my personal favorite. It is the hardest poem I've ever written thus far. And while it is about something that is deeply personal, it is also something that unfortunately is very universal. <clears throat> this poem is called Siren Song. The World Health Organization tells us that every 40 seconds, an individual somewhere on this planet takes their own life. That is to say, in the last half hour, 45 souls have been lost to suicide and they will be missed. But it can be difficult when you're on the outside looking in to understand what could possibly drive a loved one to that cliff edge, what could possibly compel them 
to dive off. There's a siren singing just offshore in the shoals of my subconscious. She spins yarns, fabricates fairy tales, fashion to make me forget all the love I'll leave behind. She seeks to strand me on jagged rocks, dash my dreams to shards and wash away my faith. She whispers secrets in the shadow of my skull, my own serpent in the garden, offering me the knowledge of life and death. If only I will fill my mouth with salt and swallow. She promises everything will be easier if I simply slip between the waves, shed my skin like scales and release my fear into oblivion. She has a plan. I've heard it so many times, I can recite it by heart. I know exactly which ship to steal in the dead of night, how far I must sail over the event horizon, past the point of no return, how to slide down the anchor chain, dwell among coral's bleached bones, how to sleep in the deep and calmly drown. She swears like a sailor, that I will give in to the inevitable. I will lose the battle with my own iron will and dissolve into sea foam. She moves, sleek, like a shark beneath the surface, daring me to dip a toe just a little bit, just to see how it feels. And it's not that I'm still listening, it's just that at the end of the day, Every day, there's a siren singing just offshore. And some days, I want to go for a swim. Mm. All right. Thank you, Ash. I hope you all enjoyed that out there tonight. We appreciate Ash for being here with us. And hopefully she'll come back and read uh, some more. Um, I think my friend Ben out there is willing to share with us tonight. Hey, man, it's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a minute. Thank you, Pam. Yeah, um, you right now, right? <laughs> yeah, yes, man. <laughs> um, yeah, so my name is Ben. My uh, poet name is Slam. Um, I think the last time I was at the Poet Center was probably like January or February. So yeah, um, been a grateful minute. to be here tonight. Um, I've got a few different poems. They're all like different themes. This first one is pretty short. Uh, it's called Sonder. I'm still working on the title, um, but it, it's like an experience, I think, that captures a feeling that we can all sort of relate to. It's kind of like a loneliness thing. So here we go. You started the night off drunk and crying due to a sadness you weren't able to understand. But after I gave you my attention, you smiled and asked how I was. You fell asleep before I got the chance to answer and left me quietly contemplating to myself. Thank you. Um, all right, so my next one is a little bit longer. It's called Modern Loneliness. It's a little, it's, I was trying to address like some of the sort of like social anxiety and mental health that problems that come along with social media. Cause I feel like um, older generations kind of like call that out a lot, especially and like accuse like younger people of always being in their phones and stuff. And to their credit, there's some truth to that. But I think there's also some deeper issues that come from that, that we aren't talking about. So uh, here's this piece. Those kids always on their damn phones, taking pictures of themselves, so self-absorbed. Why back in my day, back in your day, what? Back in your day, you found other ways to ignore the people you weren't cool with. So you can stop with the in your face holier than thou bullshit. Just admit 
you're also grateful for this screen to hide behind. Yeah. You like taking pictures of yourself and you like wasting time scrolling and scrolling. You're right though, this is a problem. You're just a little confused on what the problem is. You think we're narcissistic, but you raise us on these prison cells ever since we were little kids. Depression rates inflated. Why do you think that is? Electronic stimulation since the time we slept in cribs. Everything we think about right before we post, who are you? What sets you apart from the rest? What do you like the most? Intrusive questions about things that we don't know and beware of what you share because it can haunt you like a ghost. There's no room for growth. You're supposed to build a brand. Why tune into reality when the world is sitting in your hand? It's unsatisfying when you're watching your life unwinding as a member of the audience, disgusted by the gaudiness, the sheer ungodliness, yes. My generation is self-absorbed, but it's not based in narcissism. It's self-obsession as a cultural norm, self-obsession as a prison. The choice we make before we go to bed, do you want infinity or oblivion? Thank yeah. You. Um, and right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, ma'am. And then uh, I got one more. Um, and this was partially inspired by the, the George Floyd protest this summer. Um, but I've been wanting to write about race relations for a while. That's one mm -hmm. of my driving topics, I would say. Um, but I've had to workshop it a bit. So here's what I have. It's called Solidarity. Um, so here we go. I wanted to write about race relations, but I feel like it's all been said. I wanted to write about slave reparations and flip the system on its head. Hmm. I wanted to speak to white people and tell them we need to do better. I wanted to speak to black people and tell them we will do better. Hmm. I wanted to issue an apology because black people never got one of those hmm. for the prison clause or for slavery, for the George Wallaces and Jim Crows. I wanted to speak on black excellence and give praise to where it is due. But if black people have to be excellent, then it's clear that America has failed you. I don't have all the answers and it'd be arrogant to act like I do. But if you trust me, I will listen and I promise I'll stand with you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks man. Yeah. That slam the poet. <laughs> um, if you're still around, man, and I call you out, and if you if you're willing and want to read something else, you know, you're more than welcome to. Again, for all of you out there, if uh, you are looking to share with us tonight, please let us know in the chat, and we'll make sure that your voice gets heard. Um, we got any people? No. All right. All right, Miss Day. You're up. <laughs> My long time, long, long time, long time poetry friend, friend in general, but definitely poetry friend. <laughs> long time supporter and very gracious. Okay. It's always a pleasure to be here at Poetry Den. I have missed it for those times that I've had to be away. I missed you too, for sure. So, one of the things I wanted to share tonight is, a, is from the vault, so to say. And I've actually had people contact me about this particular poem. So I'm happy to bring it again. And I will preface it by saying that in my work, I often am called upon to go to fancy dress dinners and my events. Yeah. People ask me to come because they're supporting people who are marginalized or, or people who are homeless. Or, or there, it, it's always a good cause, but it also creates some dissonance for me to go to these fancy dress very exclusive dinner. So this is a poem about what's going on in my head as I'm attending these events. And it's called Three Gowns. My favorite. I have several fancy dress gowns. 
you know, the ones, slinky, backless, side slits, sparkles and appliques carefully positioned for modesty. Expensive covers for hangers that I wear only on the most auspicious occasions. I went to a gala in one of those very special gowns. I sat at a table in the round. There were seven others, each of us dressed in our very expensive closet ornaments. The tables were laden with plates with one, two, and three. One slice of death by chocolate cake two crusty, puffy dinner rolls dusted with flour, three garnishes, a sculpture of butter, a sprig of fennel, and a big, beautiful, glistening blackberry. I still remember that plate of three, a sprig, a sculpture, a berry, each placed just perfectly on a gleaming white plate, eight plates to a table, 50 tables, the mathematics of 400 plates by the hand of someone working for minimum wage. On a dinner she can't afford to eat, mm -hmm. thrown on behalf of poor folk who would be turned away at the door because they're not on the guest list. Mm. these fancy gowns. I wear them in rotation to commit the necessary evil of these swanky gatherings of the privileged to bring what's needed for those who place a spring, a sculpture, and a berry just so on 400 plates. So when that server rushes past me and says, hello, in one harried breath, I thank him for the absolution. So one of my personal favorites is one that I, I wrote because I have now reached the point in life, in life and my career, that I get invited to speak as an elder, <laughs> to, be, to young people, come speak to young people, talk with them, share your wisdom. And I imagine that's happened not only because I've been around for a long time, but also because I have the silver in my locks. Mm -hmm. And so I clearly <laughs> am an elder. <laughs> so one of the questions that we eventually get to each time is this question. And it happens so frequently that I finally just wrote this piece to address it. I can't believe I forgot to have children. <laughs> a slogan on a shirt poking fun at a lifestyle never intended for me, inciting unbidden commentary from unknown convents about a life not their own. I can help you with that. Lear's a wannabe Lothario whose prime was three exits back on the road of his fantasy life. Girl. You didn't forget nothing. <laughs> From a harried mother, single, judging by the sadness there to be read in her glistening eyes and the droop of her mouth as she watched mothers, fathers, couples pass her by, leaving her to ride herd on roller skates with lights, tablets with earbuds, and 20 more years of both. I didn't forget from another narrator whose opinion I did not ask. I got caught. I'm doing right though. I show up for birthdays. I pay school fees. I sit for family portraits, but you know, sometimes, a lot of the times, I dream about what if. 
You don't know how hard we've tried. You don't get what a special gift children are. You are an ingrate. Dress the voice of dreams at best delayed and perhaps forever lost. How could you hate kids so much? You must be sick or, or selfish or something. You'll spend your old age alone with no one to take care of you. Feminazi, bitch. Oh no. Bitch, <laughs> seriously? <laughs> no one else, but I like children fine. And they like me. We talk, little human to big human. We play, we dance. And even when I have to adult, we share respect. I am godmother, auntie, Miss Day, to a global village of young souls. Why don't I have children of my own? It's actually simple. Like why the color beige doesn't move me. <laughs> or why I hire out DIY projects. It's just how I'm wired. My maternal instinct bursts new ideas and foments a movement and parrots a revolution. My phone holds a manifesto for a new society in images of protesters and flyers for rallies and subversive internet memes. In between are images in layers of beauty and love and grace, a birthday party, a special dinner, landscapes and moonrises, albums with more skin than clothes shared only with a very few. <laughs> Photos of people who will come just because I cried or in those who trust me to come for them. Precious to me because they believe in my song even though they can't always hear the music. I don't have children, but I'm not worried about old age. I will be a sleek silver panther with no regrets. Yeah. Well, thank you to my good friend, Day, um, who shared some of my favorite pieces. Uh, never, too, never too far in the vault for me, uh, because I love hearing them. Um, again, if you're just tuning in with us, or if you've been here for a minute, uh, you know that you're listening to uh, the Poetry Den here at the Civil Rights Heritage Center. Um, as you know, we, we're, we're wearing masks because that's uh, what we've been mandated to do and um, definitely are in compliance with that, keep everybody safe here. Um, but we're glad that you all uh, are free to, to be with us here in your homes or wherever you're at and uh, be here with us tonight. Um, again, if you wanna read, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Um, I'm gonna share a couple pieces and then see who else is out there that wants to uh, buddy up with me. Um, I'm gonna read this piece called, You Have the Right to Remain Silent. Um, I recently, I don't know, some of you might've seen it and I'm sure I probably posted it on Facebook, but um, a couple of years ago, um, there was an incident that happened in Chicago where a woman's, um, it was the wrong house, police got into the wrong house and, um, you know, invaded in that space and she was uh, naked and handcuffed and I don't know, I was so outraged at that. Not that I haven't been outraged, but somehow that just stuck somewhere in me and I kind of thought about what if that was me and that happened to, but, so this is an older piece, but, <clears throat> Again, this makes me think of uh, some of these actions. <clears throat> so, all right. You have the right to remain silent and I could be compliant, but what justice would that do for the violence when I rely on you to protect me? You see who will protect my son should he go for an evening run, sweatpants, sneakers, and a hoodie. My baggage is I wasn't born into privilege. 
Though designed in God's image, I can still be considered suspicious. Suspicious to the idea that my freedom is cheapened by the color of my appearance. And my appearance becomes a judgment of my peers that don't mirror anything like me, yet handpicked by a prosecuting attorney. And while the jury listens to testimonies of whereabouts, determining the law with reasonable doubt, my fate lies in whether my color left you blind to a system designed to leave your conscious inclined to convict me. So when I choose the right to remain silent, I'm being silent to my opinion, which is usually mistaken for rebellion when seeking justice for all men. That's that piece. Okay. Um, this seems appropriate. I really only get uh, to read this piece once a year <laughs> um, because it's called Who Is Christmas Really About? Um, Santa Claus and who is he? Is he black, white, mixed, or Chinese? In blowing snow, I, I really can't tell. He's always begging for money, ringing a loud bell. Supposedly he brings cheer once a year, breaking an entry, yet most sincere. Leaving gifts under the tree, one year later, those credit card companies want to sue me. The world says, baby girls got to have it. Five years later, baby boys got to have it. Teacher says he's ADD. I step says he can't read. The clause in Santa is in very small print. It says, I don't love you unless I buy you a gift. When really the gift is not about you or me. It's about a man who lived to die on a tree. It's about a man whose birth is hidden behind a big red suit. Maybe the red signifies his blood shed upon the earth. The same blood that saved you and me, the blood that says I have life eternally. The blood that says I can live with my heavenly father forever, not later, but on earth as it is in heaven. That's who was Christmas really about? All right, I got one more and I'm gonna invite my friend Ash back up if you don't mind. Um, I will do, I'll do again, another favorite, uh, which is, I think some of my friends will probably be able to read this with me at some point. But uh, life, <laughs> life in its complexity. I always, I always believe that there's someone who hasn't heard something. So, <clears throat> a blind man's canvas does not stereotype in color. It absorbs each tone with a brushstroke, one after another, after another, until it creates unity, unity that comes with sincerity, a place of clarity and solidarity. Intertwined with grace, a different perspective of reality and race. And this race is so fast paced, dreams have been shuffled into how I get my next hustle, while money has become the new international version of the gospel. My mom always said, everything that glitters ain't gold and Lord knows why suicide resides in those that make people laugh for a living while depression inside creates a lynching. Life in its complexity, truth in its infidelity, justice in its immorality, Christianity in its popularity, and peace. Peace has no amount of gratuity, but then there's love the phantom in my opera, the beauty in my beast, who sings the sound of music only dream girls seek while raising in the sun. I got smoke and thoughts, gunpowder on my lips, words like bullets interject these lyrical rhymes into open minds and anyone who might be spiritually inclined to hear me. 
the two most important times in life, the day you were born and the day you figured out why. At least that's what Mark Twain said. And it made real good sense in my head, so why not share? But at the end of the day, the sun will reach its hand out to the moon. Ocean's waves will dance to an orchestra's tune. Seashells will come ashore as the Sandman prepares to confess his love once more until she stays in life's complexity. That's that piece. <laughs> All right, my friend Ash, can you come back and join us? Y'all at home, give it up for Ash. So I'm going to share uh, two this time because the first one's real short. Um, I started writing poetry when I was very young. I think I was eight or nine. There was an art festival in town and I wrote a piece and a, a man paid me 15 cents for it. And I was, I was determined to be a poet. And then when I was 16, my mother told me I wasn't any good at it and I should stop. So I did. And I didn't write another poem until I went to college in my 30s. Mm -hmm. So this poem is the first poem I wrote after 19 years of pretending I wasn't a poet. Wow. It's called My Kind of Woman. First of all, she's gonna cut the next cabron and tells her to smile. Secondly, she does smile at her girlfriend, soft like Sunday morning, just the two of them and their bulldog Frank as they walk hand in hand and leash down by the city shoreline until some asshat shouts a slur, that slur marring the mundane perfection of their morning. So she curses him in three languages like the cultured queen she is, and he flees before her fury like the pathetic peasant he is. <laughs> and triumphant in her victory, she turns to the center of her moral universe and she smiles. They continue on their walk, confident in their power, and she does not allow some random douche bro to damage their day. Yeah. <laughs> So the second poem I originally wrote for an event back in February. I was invited to speak at a Black History event at my college back in California. I was honored to share the stage with Brandon Leak, who just won America's Got Talent. Mm. If you ever get a chance to see him in person, oh, yeah. him, so he is phenomenal, phenomenal. He's yeah. life changing. And I was honored to be invited to share a stage with him and to perform yeah. at the same event. Like that was huge. That's awesome. And so for the event, I wrote a love poem to my husband of 17 years. And I asked him to come hear me speak and that I would share it, a tribute to our love. And he didn't come because he doesn't like my poetry. So I shared it with a room of strangers. Since then, we are getting a divorce. And it's not all related to that night, but that night definitely made me rethink the circumstances of our partnership. So this poem is not that poem because that poem doesn't exist anymore. I, I wrote it for him and he didn't deserve it, so I took it back. <laughs> so this poem I haven't memorized yet because I've just been rewriting it in the last month, but it's called I wrote my husband a love poem, but he was bored by my voice. So I promised not to annoy him anymore. And I rewrote his poem for someone else. <laughs> I was born running, driven by some deep seated need to explore, to achieve, born curiously hungry, never content to sit still, be quiet, behave. I've always been a mover and a shaker always ready to rumble, even though little girls ain't supposed to be fast. Mm -hmm. Skipping steps and chasing recognition like I might die if I pause for breath, except it gets lonely at the front of the path. 
Nobody likes an overachiever, especially when she makes it look so effortless. And the only way to avoid their insults and assaults on my character is to smoke the competition, leave them in the dust and laugh in the face of adversity. And maybe I don't always win, but I always push myself. And maybe I don't always do better, but I always do my best. There have been many individuals who tried to run beside me, but so far none have kept pace. See, I know the value of the perfect partner, the necessity of a complimentary companion, because sometimes life is a sprint and sometimes life is a marathon and sometimes life is a relay. And a steady stride will get you where you're going better than a race to the finish. And my next lover doesn't have to understand my motivations and they don't have to be fast in the ways that I am fast, but they do have to work because there's something to be said for stamina and a willing spirit. For a man who will step where I step, move when I move, zig every time I zag. Mm. A woman who will let me teach her the tango I invented to match the beat in my core, a song she cannot hear that I cannot adequately translate, and yet she'll always keep time. A soul who accepts my independence, accommodates my opinions, acknowledges my value, who always respects my worth and never undermines my power. And I have been told in the past that my expectations of equality make me high maintenance, but I prefer to name myself a challenge. And now I'll tell you a truth. I am a poet. I weave words into worlds that only reside in my imagination, bringing visions to life and uncovering buried truths. Language is the medium of my artistry, and yet I cannot find the words to adequately explain all the ways in which I will cherish that allegiance, all the ways I will revere their ability to adapt to the essence of my experience. That is, I must run. I must move. I must march and dance, I must sing and shout and create, I must keep going, I must keep fighting, I must not stop. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, there is no force on this earth that can contain me so long as they are beside me because I was born running. But I wasn't born to run alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Right, thank you once again, Ash, yeah. Love having new talent in the house. Love it, love it, love it. Yes. Again, I see some uh, camera on and I know you're out there. I'm gonna do one and then I'm gonna have you come on, my friend. It's been a while since I've seen you too. Um, again, those that are listening out there, we encourage you to, um, uh, you know, share some love with us on here before we uh, present our awesome feature artist. Um, so just let George know. George is looking at the chat. Uh, just let us know if you want to read tonight. So I'm going to do this, and then Cameron, if you're out there, uh, we're going to rock and roll with you, my friend. Uh, this piece that I want to share um, is uh, a poem that I wrote earlier in the year. Uh, 2020, you know, I don't even know if I got a book full of, you know, to fill enough pages of what is going on, but um, I had... Uh, some physical issues with arthritis and stuff in my neck and was on FMLA. Um, and not only that, but yesterday, Friday, I was hit in the car. And so now like I'm really super paranoid about it. But in the time that I was recovering um, and in such great amount of pain, um, there was a professor that wrote uh, an email to me and was just saying, you know, I haven't seen you in a while, and I'm just thinking about you. And uh, it brought like tears to my eyes. And there was a song that was called The Other Side that um, I happened to listen to, but it inspired this song. So it, was, it inspired this poem. All our life given the option to choose until circumstances changes all the rules. Wondering how long and why will I make it to the other side. Lying here waiting for the storm to pass, tears start to feel like raindrops, clouds build to form nose drops, thunder rolls across my heart and the beat drops. All to remember the sun never left, it always settles in the west. 
It never intends to hide. It's just on the other side. Uncertainty is the new norm when the world closes windows and doors. Our minds become a prison in time. Fear and hopelessness unite and combine. When we can't stand upright, give me the words to fight. Words to paper my pen will engage. There's a story on the other side of the page. All to remember the sun never left. It always settles in the West. It never intends to hide. It's just on the other side. I wanna make it to the other side of pain. Testify to things overcame. Be a witness to the damage now contained a feeling of peace to regain. We are but travelers passing through. May our shoes stay intact and carry no residue. Dark skies still have stars that shine their best. And the other side does not always mean death. For the sun never left. It always settles in the West. It never intends to hide. It's just on the other side. Thank you. All right, Cameron, are you still with me out there? Hey, Hello. man, hugs, hugs, virtual hugs, yeah. Hugs to you. Man, so good to see you. You as well, you as well. Yeah. Well, have that, my friend. Yeah, first I just wanted to say um, just how unbelievably thankful I am for the space, Pam. Um, poetry then, you know, I was uh, there back in my hometown, South Bend 2018. I was looking up uh, uh, poetry readings, open mics, and I found the poetry den, and I've just been such a fan and supporter ever since. And so uh, hugs and, and all the love. Yeah. And um, I just want to say uh, what amazing poets tonight uh, that, uh, that I got to hear. Um, Ash, Benjamin, Dr. Day, of course. So yeah. wonderful to, to hear you speak as always. And, and of course you, Pam, wonderful to hear uh, your quotes and your poems. So let's see, I'm on here, I'm on my phone. Let's see, can you still see me if I open up a document? Yeah, well, we should see a little, like, icon of you. That's cool, though. Oh, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> well, here, here goes the icon speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Seer to see her. I hadn't asked you your favorite part of California, so you came alive for a dream. Except you were already alive in the dream. In the dream, it was the dream you had died. In the dream, you were alive. Of course, you could tell me all about California. Of course, you could brand my cheek with your smile. In the dream, you were maybe 50. You were maybe 50 when I was born, when your parents died. I wrote it down. I wrote down on my cheek, your smile in the dream. I wrote it into life. Yeah. I've got one more. Okay. Here goes the icon again. <laughs> <laughs> my parents cut each other's hair. My dad behind scooping mom's fountain auburn. She gives him a giggle and inside words in a natural park voice. They are back volunteering together. Dad volunteers an outdoor joke with an inside voice in mom's ear, tickles her neck. Their children are not watching. Mom swoops off her cloak, exclaims, not bad. Dad, what did you expect? A role reversal. Dad in chair, 
don't go crazy because I missed that one spot. Mom's head back, gums gleaming, dad hiding, grin from the window, glinting back a portrait of nostalgic normalcy in a pandemic. Razor on the sides, only scissors on the back, only part visible to the outdoors opposite mask. Inside clips what time slowly has fallen to fall again. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hey man, when are you back in when are you back in this area, do you think? It'll be a while? I'm not sure. I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah, it might be a while. Well you look great. It's good to see you on here. Thank you. You yeah. as well. Take care. All Thanks. the love. All right. George, we got anybody else out there? We got anybody else that's all right. All right. I'm gonna do one, another one, and see if anybody else wants to, and we might roll right into our feature. Uh this uh, particular poem is called The Application. When asked to fill out the application, I say. You mean the written interrogation compiled questions of my personal information used to create a process of elimination? When asked my race, I say, do you mean the one I can barely retrace, the bodysuit, the one that has me watching Alex Haley's roots? As I troubleshoot a race with multiple names, Negro, color, black, African-American, when asked how old I am, I say old enough to know the only fair in life is the one that says elephant ears, trick games with oversized stuffed bears, and moving floors with funhouse mirrors. When asked what church I attend, I said, I've heard of better prisons with walls and laws of people trying to rise above a basic rule of thumb to love. When asked, for my references, I check my Facebook page of 550 friends and I contact all of them for a recommendation. When asked my five-year plan, I say not to let anxiety get the best of me when man-made plans don't go accordingly and competing in a poetry slam is exciting at the age of 50. When asked what brings me joy, I say when the reflection in the mirror, I truly adore. Believing the same hands that give are the same hands that can restore. And loving someone different than you is no longer a chore. Please press send to complete this application. <laughs> All right. Ash, do you wanna share any more tonight or are you good? Or? Yeah, all right. We're gonna break it. Okay, Zarina's gonna okay, Ash, I'm gonna have you do one and then we'll bring Zarina in and <clears throat> all right, um, let's see. So social media is kind of a funny place. <laughs> funny, <huh? laughs> And you can get in arguments with strangers over interesting things. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> this particular poem is called an artisanal handcrafted insult for the lady on Facebook who didn't like my tone. <laughs> you are artificially sweetened and lack substance. Too small an effort to be a meal, but a little too much to stomach in one sitting. Store-bought and manufactured from unnatural additives intended to preserve your stale ideology long past the use-by date. I don't enjoy cake, though I suppose someone must, not even in bite-sized morsels. Any amount of saccharine subterfuge is frankly too bitter on my tongue to allow to pass my lips, and therefore I will take a pass on you. I'd apologize for my standards, but the truth is you're not trying very hard to impress me. And there's no natural law that requires me to accept your presence in my life. 
In the end, you are a paradox that I can calmly ignore, both too plain and too complicated for my honest palate. I will walk right past you on the way to something flavorful, nutritious, worth my currency, and not gain so much as an ounce of shame in my thighs. I'm sure you are someone's guilty pleasure, but I'm afraid I don't consume trash, mm. no matter how shiny the package or dense the frosting. And honestly, this whole conversation has been ridiculous, so I'll be on my way. Cupcake. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my friend Zarina, we're gonna bring you on before we start our do our future poet. Uh, you out there? What's up, Z? Z. Yeah. Oh wait, I'm on mute. <laughs> Can you hear me now? <laughs> I wasn't even gonna say anything, but ah, who am I kidding? So yeah, who are you kidding? <laughs> Man, okay, so uh, all right, um, so I'll just share one poem uh, tonight, and this is going to be from my uh, thesis, and um, well, it's untitled, it's titled, but I don't want to say anything yet, and this poem will actually be, it might be different by the time I'm done with my MFA, so this, it's titled, When the Street Lights Are On, But the Sky Is Still Blue. Yeah. Uh, my body is a black canvas, lightning, electric veins, expose my darkness, street light beacon, yawning, pulsing, quickening my pace, I'm moonwalking, floating in place somewhere amongst the stars, twinkling me home to the next block like the North Star, where the indigo sky looms playing peekaboo with the solar system. I tuck my hands and chin in my hoodie pullover, zoned in on my white girl Payless tennis shoes, not kids, through Measle Grove Park, treading respectfully through lofty silhouette trees, hiding, setting sunlight, hiding me, hiding boogeyman mm. bedtime tales. Picture a little black hood girl taking a shortcut through a dark park, unafraid. Stuff writers make movies about what the boogeyman wants, a hopeful spirit that had already been taken. I quicken my pace before these trees take me in. Mm. Yeah, thank you, thank you. This girl's doing stuff, you gotta follow her. Uh, Instagram, yeah. She is doing it. She done moved away from here and just exploded. Uh, so now, you know, thank you all who, who have uh, come alongside of us and did some open mic tonight. Ash, thank you for being here. Um, as always, I hope you come back. But today, you know, you already know Cameron, Ben, um, and Z. So thank you so much. I'm going to introduce our um, awesome poet for tonight, um, someone that I've known for quite a long time. Um, he kind of, you know, set the fire going with poetry here in South Bend, him and Day, uh, Dr. Day here um, have been in cahoots with one another and definitely, you know, birthed a lot of amazing poets in this area. So I'm gonna do his, I'm gonna try to do his uh, bio that he sent me as much justice as I can possible. Uh, Jay has been performing spoken word poetry since he can remember learning to talk. He and the late Curtis Trent Jr. created Poetic Flow, a two-man choreo poem touring the Midwest in the mid-90s. After founding IUSB Poetry Jam in 1997, Andre signed a recording contract with the producer and CEO, Mark Harris in Nashville, Tennessee, and completed his master's degree in psychology at the, the world-renowned Fisk University. Andre completed all doctoral coursework in counseling psychology at the, I'm not, I'm not gonna say this right, so you can correct me. Treveca Nazarene University in Nashville. Please forgive me for not pronouncing that right. Andre's passion is in serving children diagnosed with autism, 
and he believes that metaphors and storytelling heal the individual and the community. Uh, I'm gonna mention this, even though I don't think it needs to be mentioned, but he says, it is with much honor and respect that I am afforded the opportunity to share with Pam Blair, a modern hero. I don't know why I'm reading that, at the poetry there. So please at home and everybody here, let's give it up for Dre, the poet. Kim Fowl, Kim Fowl, Kim Fowl, you did a good job with your back in that terrain. Good job, Pam Blair, you educated, baby. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I got, listen, there's some fantastic poets throughout this country, and South Bend is birthing so many of them. I, I mean, quick, Pam, can you hear me? Because you're screaming. Hey, we can hear you. From. We can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Am I talking too loud? It's a little loud, but we can, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. See, my wife will walk by and get me straight real quick. <laughs> <laughs> excited, Pam. I really am. I really am. Uh, it's a lot of cool people on the phone, too, from Nashville. South Bend, y'all got to know you got a second home in Nashville. Yeah. You got a second home. I got a lot of cool cats on the call. I'm not going to call no names out. There's a lot of them on here. Just to spread love. Just to spread love. Um, I'm going to do a hard stop. Listen, Zarina, you got off with that, baby girl. Keep going with that MFA and keep going to your terminal degree with the doctorate because you need to keep birthing what's in you, baby girl. I love you. And me and Zarina go back to in mm. the 90s. All right. So, Z, God is using you. Keep going. Ash, keep going. Cameron, keep going. Uh, who else? I'm not going to miss uh, Dave, Dr. Bryant, Ben. I love y'all. And Pam, you are a hero. <laughs> you, you walk in who you are. Straight up, put on the cape, baby. Put on the cape. <laughs> put on the cape. Straight up, <laughs> right. All right. So this this quick performance is called "Medicinal Musical Moments." Medicinal musical moments all came to me this morning. Huh. When we say "lift every," when we sing "lift every voice and sing" the Black National Anthem, we got to be real careful, Black folk. Because there are so many songs and voices inside of our anthem. Luther Vandross is in our anthem. Mahalia Jackson is in our anthem. Anita Baker is in our anthem. Whitney Houston is in our anthem. If Black folks don't sing, we going to go off. I'm going to repeat that. If we don't sing, we going to go off. Big Daddy Kane is in that anthem. I'll prove it. I just saying something for y'all to enchant them. So let's all sing the Big Daddy anthem. Go with the flow, my rhymes flow like an afro. Entertain the game, the cane, and never have no problem. I can sneak, sniffle, and cough. Even if I study, I'ma still go off. If black folks don't sing, we gonna go off. So intermittently, you're gonna see an icon come up with some music that has blessed our generation. I meditate on them, and that's how the poems get created for me. Poems get created through people. So medicinal, musical moments. I pray that y'all enjoy this. Let me know if you can hear, Pam. Yeah. Yeah. Dre, you're not waiting on me, right? Uh-uh. Okay, all right. So, that poem, that piece was by uh, Soul to Soul, Back to Life. And the name of this piece that, that, I, that, that inspired this poem is called Direct Our Paths. Okay. Direct Our Paths. Thank you, Jesus. Back in the 70s, my mama was a booster with her college degree and was clocking food stamps. So as an itty bitty boy, we were sitting pretty. But when we get to the nitty gritty, we see that it's time to stop dreaming and start weaning grown Negroes off the government's titty. Mm. 
And it's a pity that some of our uncles are so sedity that every time they think about a Negro in the inner city, they can't hardly stand it. Because they was brainwashed by some brain dead preacher who said that the way that those Negroes act in the ghettos ain't the way that my heavenly father planned it. So they abandoned the drama, leaving our mamas and grandmamas stranded. Well, the only thing that a Negro in the ghetto has demanded is love. And thus far, we've only come up empty handed. Because there's a million bandits behind the pulpit preaching double standards. Therefore, we listen to the preaching of Biggie Smalls and the teaching of the Ten Crack Commandments. Consequently, every sold out BJ on MTV crams to understand it. And as a member of Generation X, the last thing I'm going to do is take my social status for granted. So grant me one wish for the relative whom I wish I was never related. Every time they come around, they judge our dress, look at our culture, and play a hate. Mm-hmm. Now we see what the notorious B.I.G. meant when he said rule number seven is absolutely underrated. Because it takes the Holy Ghost to keep your natural family and your father's business completely separated. Because mm. it wasn't until my mama started smoking rocks that our family came together to pray and fast. Reminded me of the Old Testament priests who would intercede, dressing themselves in sackcloth and ash. Mm. Same way Generation X intercedes for the Nike Corporation as it leads Tiger Woods across our present day slave master's grass. But it don't seem like nobody's interceding for me until I send a CD ministry some cash. Mm. It would be wise for some baby boomers to cash out when Generation X is ready to blast. Because every non-white person knows what it feels like to be non-verbally harassed. And just because a female lives in a trailer park and does not entitle her to be looked at as white trash. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we collectively ask, who going to have that last jolly laugh on Judgment Day when God hooks up a spiritual polygraph? Mm. Because in times past, some of them took their own lives. So some of us pray that the stock market would finally crash. So whether you black or you white, like a thief in the night, my Messiah will be back in a flash. <laughs> in fact, Jesus said it will be easier for camels to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get to heaven. So forgive me if I sound too rash. Because on behalf of Generation X, which represents over half of the underclass, we will acknowledge God the Father in all of our ways. And only he can direct our path. Direct our pants. Yeah. Yeah. Now it is Christmas season, so we're going to somehow get into this season. I heard this brother speak on CBS in the morning, and he really touched my heart, his family. His name is Leslie Odom Jr. So y'all just want to try to feel this cut. Go to iTunes. He ain't paying me, so I ain't getting no kickback. But it's a lovely Christmas album, and here's the first track off of it. All right, all right, all right. That was Leslie Odom Jr. with you Snow. We didn't hear nothing. We didn't, get to hear nothing. we didn't get to hear it. You didn't get to hear it? No, we was just waiting. We thought you was doing something, man. 
I was him here. I was banging with it. <laughs> yeah. I thought I needed to sing, sing some Christmas songs or something in between there. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I thought you was hearing it all. Did, okay. Well, we we keep rolling. Leslie Odom Jr. The name of the song is Snow. Okay. Oh, it's phenomenal. It is phenomenal. Phenomenal. And matter of fact, he dedicated the song to. Um, it was National Foster Care Day on Friday, mm-hmm. and so there's there's a layered meaning inside of why I'm pushing it. And mm-hmm. one of those that's deep to my heart is James 127. Uh, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is to visit the fatherless. And so this entire album just pushes that movement. And the dude is, I mean, the dude can just let out sing. Yeah, I love that song. Out. No, I love that song. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, I play it like every yeah. day. Yeah. So, so Pam, let me know if you can hear when I do the next one. So the, the name of the poem that goes with that is called When Mary's Water Broke. It's a short piece, y'all. Okay. It's a real short piece. It's a Christmas piece. And I ain't got, matter of fact, I only got one Christmas piece. And here you go. Uh, when Mary's water broke. For the sake of the body of Christ and to the glory of God, there were absolutely and positively no jokes mm. when Mary's water broke. There was no primary care physician set up to give secondary referrals. There were no epidurals when Mary's water broke. There was no witness protection program set up to keep Mary and Joseph safe from danger. There were no receiving blankets, but God ensured the Eastern star rested high above that receiving manger when Mary's water broke. There was a lot of love and a lot of tears, a lot of hope to outweigh a lot of fears. There's no greater story we could ever cheer. Hope broke fear Mm. when Mary's water broke. Yeah. (laughs) All right, we going into the next one. Now this is my favorite uh, artist, Pam. Can you hear this, Pam? Yeah, we can still hear you. Can you hear the music though? We can't see your screen. It's just it's just the uh, icon of you. And you can't hear any music? No. Mm-mm. Fine. Okay. Well, we gonna forego that and keep it going. My favorite, <laughs> one of my favorite hip hop artists. He inspired this piece. Uh, he goes on a hiatus. God, I'm probably following after his footsteps. Going on a hiatus with. Uh, with with poetry <laughs> uh, and he goes by the name of andre benjamin or andre 3000 from outcast mm. all right and it's this it's this line that he says in big boy's album on royal flush he says when all the other kids are broke and they got new nintendo Wheeze, and your child is down on her knees, praying hard up to God for a waffle with cheese. Do you A, hit the street hard with a flare, or do you B, go to school for heating and air? Dare make an honest living, or make a crit killing, or do a bit of both until you're holding on to millions? Brilliant. You got one foot in, one foot out, and you put your left foot back in, then you shake it all about. <laughs> you do the hokey tokey till you turn the rifle out. That's what it's all about, 3,000 hours. So I was going to play that for y'all and set this poem up. I had to spit it, though, and you saw how I fumbled with it a little bit. That keeps it honest and, you know, humility. God, God uh-huh. honors humility, right? So the poem is called, I don't, I'm not telling y'all anything you don't already know. Okay. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. Jesus, it's one that... I don't want to do it all because it take a lot out of me. And more, Moira Disco is on here and she remembers this. Um, I'm just going to hit a few pieces of it because I ain't going to be before y'all long. I got a hard stop, Pam, at 6.30. I got some brothers who I serve with in Nashville. Mm-hmm. And I mean, these brothers, when everything Ash was saying, everything Cameron was saying, oh my God. Um, everything Ben was saying, Ben, you're a fantastic soul, man. Um, <laughs> these brothers give to the homeless. Um, they, they cut hair. Um, I mean, it's endless and I'm honored to be with them to serve. And a lot of them are on the call now. So we got a meeting at six 30 that I'm gonna have to do a hard stop because, uh, I would be doing, um, God a disservice if I didn't jump off and plan out how we going to serve more. Okay. Um, so I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. 
We live in a capitalistic farce that believes education is the key. My homeboy got caught with a couple keys and my mama didn't start smoking rocks until after she had two college degrees, one in accounting, the other in business administration. Ask any nation or nationality, would they rather vacation in the projects of Chicago or the Florida Keys? We should consult the congressman and convict for their socioeconomic expertise. Because the school of hard knocks tells me it's not what you know, it's who you know. Mm -hmm. And corporate America tells me that who you know, it's who got that dough. Because yeah. there ain't no telling what J.R. and Sue Ellen might do when Ewing oil gets low. <laughs> Leading me back to my general premise, because I'm not telling y'all anything that you don't already know. Hmm. President Clinton stated it plainly. The key to the war on drugs is not to be found in education. It's to be found in homes across family tables. But that's the catch with being politically correct. You only get part fact and part fable. Now I see why have-nots aren't able to stop smoking weed because that table at home helped cause it. Jesus said the key to the war on drugs is to be found in your prayer closet. I'm just drawing a distinction between the things that are Caesar's and the things that are God's. Because if I deal with you as a man, I'd be far from shocked. In fact, I wave my middle finger up high and say, the pie in the sky. Hmm. But the Holy Spirit humbles me down because God is not a man that he should lie. If you don't know, now you don't. I'm just one of them have nots that's ready to die. Uh, my God. Okay, now I'm gonna take a turn, Pam. <laughs> I gotta take a turn. I gotta take a turn. When I came to Nashville, the love bug hit me off top. <laughs> Cupid, look, look, Cupid was doing all kind of remixes yeah. on me. <laughs> Cupid was jack. I mean, he was jacking my heart up. I mean, the brother, man, got a good shot. Fell in love, got married, got divorced. Look, had a baby. All that, all like, like the stuff that I preached against fell on me, right? <laughs> That's I'm how just going to keep it 100 with all of y'all. Look, South Bend don't know that part. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, but God is so faithful. Um, he has blessed me with a queen. Um, when I was not looking, I was done with relationships. So what Ash was talking about, Ash, me and you right here, sister. You <laughs> are right here, Ash. Like you were opening your old wounds and healing them in the same breath. Okay. Yeah. All right, so this piece, um, this piece is called The Type of Woman. It's called The Type of Woman. And when I was courting my now wife, this is the poem that kind of bubbled up. All right, it's called The Type of Woman. The Type of Woman. The Type of Woman. You're the type of woman who makes me analyze my inhibitions the type of sister who makes me find time to listen. Yeah. And the irony is that the same letters in the word silent are the exact same letters in the word listen. Yeah. But don't misconstrue my silence as the passive type. I just know that obedience is better than sacrifice. Yeah. So I'm gonna be incredibly quiet so I can be all the way obedient to everything that God is telling us. That's why I ain't got time for jaw jacking with the fellas. I'm just so grateful and thankful. I want to massage your ankles until your calf muscles get jealous. <laughs> hey. You're the type of sister who make a brother want to know how to act. So I'm going to use my palms and forearms on the nerve endings of your lower back. Okay. Because you're the type of woman who needs to walk into work with an upright and Christ-like posture. The type of spirit that repels the fiery darts of the imposter. Hmm. And those fiery darts are oh so subtle. Like when grown women walk in the break room and start chit-chatting about the cool dude's cologne. <laughs> you look at it like they hilarious because you got all of that at home. Hmm. <laughs> That's why I pray God carry us until we return to clay and they bury us. Matter of fact, the day the bishop married us, I treated your body like 
Sam's Club on a Saturday morning, real life taste testing in various areas. Because <laughs> you're the type of woman who makes me take it all to the altar and leave it all there. Wow. And I thank God for you being that type of woman. Woo! Yeah! <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> I don't need no blue pills tonight. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Listen, 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 listen. Oh, yeah. Let me tell you why I was screaming so loud, but I'm also excited. <laughs> my son, my son's birthday is this week. This piece was dedicated to him 19 years ago. Okay. Okay. My son, the poem is called Blossom. I'm going to hear you. Good night. Uh, yeah, this is going to be the last piece. It's okay. called Blossom. It's okay. a signet. It's, it's really, um, I hope you hear God in it. I really do. I really do. Um, Lil Dre was born three months premature, two pounds and three quarters of an ounce. And now he's six foot four, 230 some pounds. So I can say God is good. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> So the poem is called Blossom. This is the last piece, y'all. I thank God for South Bend. I thank God for Dave Bryant, Civil Rights Heritage Center, uh, IUSB. Blossom, blossom, blossom. <sighs> There's an old saying. If you feed a child long enough, he'll look like you. Fertilize him in the word of God, he'll blossom. Unless we're exposed to the wisdom of the previous generation, we don't have an alternative but to roll over and play possum. Mm. The Apostle Paul wrote the entire book of Colossians locked in a segregated cell. Same way Martin Luther King Jr. wrote his most exclusive piece of literature, Letter from the Birmingham Jail. Because both messages entail themes of brothers who zero in on reconciliation of man to Christ the resurrection of Christ from hell, and the resilience to bounce back from hell-like situations and still excel. Please believe me, the devil didn't derail the Underground Railroad by some scientific hocus-pocus. He did it by broken focus. Because Harriet Tubman was so focused on helping the hopeless, she carried two pistols, one for the various bounty hunters the other for the scariest Negro who didn't want to be free. <laughs> W.E.B. and Booker T. were passionately committed to Blacks being blessed by using their brains rather than being oppressed by using their backs. Here's a little poem about how the Underground Railroad got off track. If your mama's on crack, then my mama's on crack. Mm -hmm. If your brother on crack, my brother on crack. But it ain't no telling what the daddies is doing because we don't know where they at. Mm. Whenever there's a disconnection between father and son, the Underground Railroad couldn't help but collapse. But fatherlessness among African-Americans has been an epidemic for a minute. And the media was invented to mock and mimic biblical truths. James 1.27, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and remain unspotted from the world. And it don't make a bit of difference what world you belong to. The media will never be responsible for waking me up. Psalms 27.10, when my mother and father have forsaken me, God has taken me up. I can literally see W.E.B. Du Bois and waking up to a summer internship, walking all kind of miles from Fisk, just to teach the fatherless how to read, understand, and appreciate the resurrection. Huh. That brother's affection was set on passing it on. Because when Batman is dead and gone, it'll be Robin's responsibility to save Gotham. But it won't be no BET or high-definition TVs to watch them. Psalm 119 was verbally given to brothers to help keep their way clean from the devil's concoctions. That's how Timothy's focus was enhanced, the way that Paul role-modeled Christ in Colossians. The more I zero in on Christ today, the more likely little Andre's kids 
will have stock options. I'm going to mm -hmm. finish this form exactly where I started. If you feed a child long enough, he'll look like it. Mm -hmm. Fertilize him in the word of God. He'll blossom. Yeah. Hey. I love y'all immensely. Yeah, thank you so much. I love y'all immensely. Yeah, make sure you send me your address. I will. And Pam, do a plug for the poets coming up with the poetry then the next two months. Oh my God, it's about to be off the meter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and one of them is probably in here, Michael McClendon Diallo. He's a dope poet who needs to feature in Nashville. I'm telling you, South Bend, y'all got a place to stay when you come to Nashville. We got to kick it. Soon as soon as these vaccines jump off, it's going to jump off. <laughs> <laughs> All, all of you all that are out there, if you clap your fingers, clap your hands for Dr. Dre here. I love y'all. Bye bye. Yeah. Pam, I better jump on this call so I can be I can be respectful. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love y'all. I love y'all. Bye bye. So everybody, uh, once again, I just want to um, say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for closing out this year with the poetry, Dan. Thank you for supporting us. Uh, thank the Civil Rights Heritage Center for allowing us to be here. Uh, for George that shows up faithfully uh, and doesn't allude to not wanting, ever wanting to be here. <laughs> and to his family that allows him to be here. Uh, we got a great, we got some great uh, featured artists coming up in this next year. Um, and hopefully um, some other things that are coming down the pike so um, stay tuned to our page, you know, um, visit us, put, you know, if you got something to say, let us know, uh, let us know how we're doing. Um, again, for, for all of you out there listening and for, for my guest here tonight, uh, we just wish you um, the best of holidays. Hope that we can, you know, find some joy, uh, even in this midst of confusion and, and sometimes undecisiveness. We just wish you that wish that you could find some joy, some happiness, and some memories, uh, or within the, the the confinements of your own home with the people that you live with or with yourself. Uh, for those of you that um, <clears throat> know someone that lives alone, call them, call them, say hey, how you doing? Happy holidays. Uh, text them. Let's show some love to one another. And again, um, I'm appreciative of the poetry. Again, I'm appreciative of all of you supporters. And we hope to see you next month. And yeah, God bless. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.